be honest with you. We're going to start in verse number 20. Now this is Solomon still talking to his, his son, or, or a letter here for uh, all of his kids, and he is trying to get them to understand that all of this wisdom he's telling them, every instruction that he's giving them, it is for his own growth, his own good. Don't turn away from this. Have you ever in your life been given some advice and because of who gave you the advice, you changed your mind completely? Well, most of us as kids do that. I mean, that's why a lot of times to get your kid to do what they need to do, you have to tell them to not do something weird and they'll be like, well, I'll show you and then they'll do what you tried to get them to do. You know, reverse psychology is what they call that. And it works sometimes. I mean, it was it was easy for us to, uh, you know, have some of that control. Um, when we had Jeannie, my little sister, she was 12 years younger than me, so when she was about three or four years old, I was a teenager and lazy. So I'd be like, Jeannie, go get me a Coke out the fridge. She'd be like, you go get your own Coke. I'd be like, hurry, let me see how fast you can do it. One, two, oh! And she had to go. She had to see if she could get back fast. And, you know, looking back, do you know what she took away from that? She counted for her kids so that when they went and did what she wanted them to do, they could see how fast they did it. This type of wisdom is learned. Okay, it's passed down from generation to generation, right? And Solomon was trying to give a firm foundation for his children so that they would understand that this instruction that he was giving them was good instruction. It's good. We don't uh, edify our kids to, to cre create harm for them, do we? No, we, we tell them what they need to know for, for their benefit, for their good, and, and for everybody's good. He says in verse number 20, Proverbs 1.20, Wisdom calls aloud in the street. She raises her voice in the public squares. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. In the gateways of the city, she makes her speech. How long will you simple ones love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? If you had responded to my rebuke, I would have poured out my heart to you and made my thoughts known to you. Now, let's stop right there for just a moment. Paul, uh, Paul, Solomon, and Proverbs reminds me of something that Paul would write, but Solomon is writing here that there is no excuse. You cannot claim ignorance. You cannot say, I didn't know when it comes to the wisdom of God. Okay? Everybody has been offered the ability to know the mysteries of God. You cannot stand before God and tell God, well, I wasn't given an opportunity to know you. I wasn't given a chance to know about you. The Bible says that God will send people there. He will shed His light on all the creation. And how will they know who it is that has called them? Because He will send people to tell them. And I think everybody that's supposed to hear Jesus Christ preached is going to hear Jesus Christ preached. Your part in that evangelism is your benefit. God's going to speak. He's going to touch hearts. Whether we get to see it or not depends on if we're involved or not, right? So His wisdom tells us that the information is there for everybody. So nobody is without excuse. If you ever... Let me ask you this. Have you ever been convicted of something that you hadn't read in the Bible? You just knew it was wrong? You didn't have to read it in the Holy Bible to know that you know, murder was wrong. You knew that killing somebody was wrong before you read it in Exodus, right? Yeah. You knew that being adulterous was, was wrong before you ever read about it. It's just, you know, this wisdom is made known to us. So, he is saying here that it calls loud in the street, it calls loud in the public squares, the noisy streets cries out. How long, in verse number 22, will you simple ones, which means immoral in heart, how long will you simple ones, the ones that have never given your heart to Jesus Christ, how long will mockers delight in mockery? He goes on to say, and I believe it's Proverbs 30, I have to look it up. Those that trample on the name 
of Jesus, those that trample on God, will one day, because of that mockery, they too will be mocked. I don't know if you've ever had your Creator laugh at you because you were lost. It says in verse 23, If you had responded to my rebuke, I would have poured out my heart to you and made my thoughts known to you. Everything that you needed to know, that you wanted to know, I would have told you. I would have shared it with you. But since you mocked me, since you didn't accept, since you rejected me, since you ignored, in verse 25, all my advice and would not accept my rebuke, I in turn will laugh at your disaster. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. You see what this says here? This is what God inspired Solomon to write to his kid. So when you revolt against God, when you make a mockery of God, when you say, I know what that commandment is, but I'm not going to follow it. What he is saying that when calamity overtakes you, because you better be sure your sin will find you out, right? You can't get away with anything. you got to pay the piper. you got to settle up with the accountant. Whatever you want to say, one day you're going to have to pay for it. Okay? And this payment, when it comes, I'm going to tell you all something. This is heartbreaking. Can you imagine a soul that's living their life and they're just living their life? They're not bad. They're just living their life. And one day, grace is going to be gone. There will be no more chances after that. And in that time, God will look. And I had to research this this. this um, where it says that He will laugh at your disaster, I will mock you. There is absolutely zero chance that your Creator will ever look at you and be glad, happy, that you turned away from it. He took the time to create you. He put a lot of thought into you. That goo inside of your head, he put thoughts and the ability to contain thoughts inside of that. And that should that that don't make sense. It shouldn't be. It had to be designed by something far more intelligent than us. Had to be. And and he made it. But if you live this life, this this hundred years here on earth, for you, and you turn against God and you you do not accept His rebuke. When you are convicted, you say, no, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do what makes me happy. I'm going, to, I'm going to be who I want to be and all of these things. And one day God is going to look and instead of laughing at you out of happiness, y'all ever seen somebody laugh because there's nothing left to do? When you get so distraught that you just... That's what God's going to do. It is laughing in disbelief. How could somebody give God disbelief? God created you and He knew whether you were going to accept Him or not. But there will be a day when all creation will have to give an account for whether they responded to God or not. Your Creator created you so that you could have an eternal life with Him. We are told in the Bible that there is going to be judgment on earth. In that moment, when Jesus comes back to get His church, we are told that in that moment, the dead in Christ shall rise, and you can read about this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that the dead in Christ shall rise, and those that are left behind shall in like manner be changed in the twinkling of an eye, and we shall meet Jesus in the air. 
After that will be the marriage supper of the Lamb, the, the bride, the church will finally be joined together with the groom and it's going to be a celebration. And for seven years, the church will finally be with Jesus. And those laughing moments with Christ in that moment will be happiness. He's with us. Do you know while he is at the banquet with his bride, those of you who have chosen him, who have followed him, he is going to look down on the earth where every single person that has turned against him is left behind. And in that moment, he will be with his bride. But he will look down and see all of the ones that mocked him. They said they wanted to live their life. They didn't want him. They didn't want his rebuke. They didn't want no part of it. And they are living their lives full in judgment here on earth. The church is gone. Grace is gone. The Holy Spirit's gone. And in that moment, I can imagine Jesus looking down, surrounded by His bride, those of us that have chosen to follow Him. And He has got a smile on His face. But He's not happy. Not when he looks down and sees all those people. For those people, there will be not another chance. The ones that he has called, the ones that he has told, after that, look, if a person will not turn to Jesus right now while the Holy Spirit is calling them and convicting them, do you think that person has any shot against Satan by themselves? If they won't get saved now while the Holy Spirit is here working to help them to understand the wisdom that is being spread and shared with them, there will be no hope for them then. And besides that, the Bible says that God will harden their hearts so that they won't even be able to be saved. It will only be the ones that haven't heard. And y'all, there ain't many of those in the world. There will be some that get saved during that time. But that is called the tribulation period, which means judgment. So judgment will be dealt out here on earth. Whew. Verse 27 of Proverbs 1 says, When calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you, that's when he will turn and laugh. Verse 28 says, Then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me. Since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord. Since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways. It's like you reap what you sow, right? If you want to live a life without God, God will let you live it without Him. But if you want to live a life with God, then God is happy to live a life with you. He is happy to take you and forgive everything that you've ever done because Jesus made that possible. And right now in the age of grace, grace is here and God's showing His favor by making a way that we could be forgiven of our sins, right? So we have chosen to believe in Him. We have been, been saved by the blood of Jesus. We have been set up and now we are flawless in the eyes of God. So God sees us and now we are not like these folks. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. We didn't hate knowledge. He says in verse 32, For the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them, but whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear or harm. Okay, that's good news. Somebody look up Romans 8.1. What's it say? Bible drill. Verse 32. There's a who? There's a who? Is that one? There's now no what? Look at look at Bible drill up here on the screen. There is now no condemnation, which means judgment. For what? For those in Christ, right? If you have been saved and the blood of Jesus Christ has washed over you, you are in Him, you are a new creation, therefore there is no condemnation for you. That means that you will not ever be on the wrong side of God. That means if the, the rapture took place right now, Jesus come to God His church, you're going to go. 
you're going to go. You're not going to be stuck here. Like, boy, I sure do hope that I can withstand against the devil because I've been just following him so far, but now I'm ready to change sides. It don't work like that. It don't work like that. You know, what I like is that God has put so many different churches on the earth with, with different styles. I mean, you could go to one church and be, you know, be a very quiet, traditional type church. One might have a lot of standing and sitting. One might have a lot of shouting or speaking in tongues, but I like the way that people respond to being saved. But I would like for our church to level it up a little bit this year. Um, let me explain. Let me explain. It's, it's great that when we get to talking about people being left behind and stuff, it's great that it breaks your heart. It should. And it should always make you think about somebody that you know or love that ain't ready if the rapture took place today. But does it make you just want to dance a little bit when you get to thinking about the fact that you ain't going to hell? I mean, does it, does it kind of excite you a little bit and put some perspective on your problems when you get to thinking about the fact that Jesus Christ looked down upon you in your lowest state and considered you worthy of saving and He decided to come down here and die on a cross, be separated from God all for you? Yeah, He did that for you. And I'm like, that's very humbling that Jesus did that for me. You know, it's very humbling that my whole life, I mean, I was just I was just jerking the steering wheel away or a deer jumping up at the right time away from meeting Jesus and not being ready. He was long-suffering. He was merciful. He was patient with me. You know, he was working things together so that he could do things that show me things, reveal his, his wisdom to me. And looking back, I'm like, my daddy was trying to teach me all along. He was with me every step of the way. I mean, he, he called me to preach. He knew how much I spit. Y'all been seeing it, right? I know Jim be like, won't you go back up there? <laughs> I get down here, Jim put a coat on and be like, all right. Give me one of them COVID shields, right? <laughs> If you get excited about being saved, you want to get up and dance a little bit, you go right ahead. All right? You get excited about Jesus, you just go right on ahead. You want to say amen, you ain't going to scare me. You ain't going to scare me. I want somebody to out-preach me is what I want. Because I'm going to tell you all something. I was thinking about it the other day on the lawnmower. About when when Tony London would sit right here on the front row, and he would get so into it that if I paused for a split second, he was gonna jump in and take over. And he preached me to death because I couldn't stop. I just, you just said, there wasn't no pauses. You had to keep at it. The Tony would go. He got so excited that he was gonna jump in there and just, and let me testify and just go at it. You know, y'all remember that, right? And and I got to thinking about that. Look at the goosebumps. I'm like, I that's, I want some I want some of that. Some of that. I want some of that. So uh so yeah, just interrupt me a lot, Sunday. And <laughs> not really, but it's all right. Anyway. Y'all got any questions? I think that's all. Thank you.